All right, so now let's look at design patterns on a lower level. The ones that we're going to talk about now are directly for program code, so on a very low level, basically. And um, basically all of the pat patterns I'm going to discuss now are from the book uh, shown here, Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. And the first author is Eric Gamma. Uh, for that reason, the book is also often called the Gamma book, sometimes also the Gang of Four book, because it has four authors, or the GOF book. And this book contains 23 common patterns that the authors collected from existing code uh, and where they found common solutions once again to problems that happen again and again. Um, it's worth noting that the book and the examples were written for C++, so there may be occasions where some of the patterns aren't actually quite as applicable anymore uh, in other programming languages because some of the uh, patterns are actually workarounds for things that C++ doesn't support or didn't support at that time. So if you have a newer version of C++ or uh, Java, for example, then it might actually be uh, the case sometimes that uh, some of the patterns aren't uh, quite as useful anymore. But the ones uh, I'm going to talk about in the lecture are kind of timeless and they can be used uh, in C++ and Java and Python, it doesn't really matter. Um, the patterns have been grouped into three categories. There's the uh, creational, structural, and behavioral patterns. And today uh, we're going to talk about the creational ones first. So of course, the idea behind those is that we want to create other objects. And some of the examples I'd like to discuss today are the singleton, the, the abstract factory, the factory method, and the prototype. And uh, on this web page here, you can find a bit of background reading um, about how these patterns relate to each other, but we're also going to cover that uh, in the rest of this uh, of this lecture. All right. So first of all, the singleton. This is maybe the most common design pattern, and the problem is that uh, for specific types of classes, you want to make sure that there is only one instance of that class, so that there is only ever one object um, that other um, parts of the program will share, and that you can't create additional instances of that uh, of that class. And the idea behind that is sometimes, for example, you have a hardware abstraction, so you have a, for example, a camera device, and then of course, um, only one, uh, uh, one driver, so to say, for that camera can exist. And if you create a second one, then you will get all sorts of uh, race conditions and uh, access, uh, access collisions uh, on the hardware. Um, so the fundamental idea behind the singleton is that the class itself uh, gets the responsibility for managing its instance. It's one single instance. And in Java code, this can actually easily fit on a single slide. So um, here is how this looks like. So we have a class, of course. Let's say this class just encapsulates a value. And the really important part is this, uh, this line here. So we have a private static vari variable. Static, of course, means that this one variable is shared across all instances of the, um, of the class. Uh, and it actually exists before uh, an, an individual object has been created. And uh, the next important part is that the constructor of the class is actually protected. So you cannot access the constructor from outside. You cannot create a new object of that class on its own. You can only use this instant method below here to get access to to such a global class object. So if you call instance and there isn't, because it's static, you can always do that without having to create an object first. Um, if the instance variable, the static instance variable is still null, then we create a new uh, instance, of course. This is now possible because the constructor is protected, uh, but we're inside the class itself, so we can also access the protected constructor and can actually create a new object and then we we'll return that. And when the instance function is called for the next time, then of course, uh, as instance will already have a value and we return that same instance. So there will only ever be a single object of a global class, which is stored basically inside itself in this uh, static instance variable. 
So the most important aspect is that this part is private and this part here, the constructor, uh, is uh, protected. And so it's not accessible from, both of them are not accessible from the outside. You always have to go through this global class instance method. All right, so much already for the singleton. Um, now let's talk about the abstract factory. Abstract factory is a pattern where um, we don't create objects on our own anymore. We don't use new object or something, but we rather call a method on the factory object uh, and delegate the task of object creation to that factory object. And, uh, the original uh, use case for this was um, to create different types of user interface elements. So if you have multiple families of objects that are uh, related and basically follow the same, for example, inheritance structure, then this is a very good example. Um, I'll show you an example in a moment. The important part is that for each family, for each class of, uh, for each, um, yeah, for each family of object, let's call it like this, for each family of, of object, you then also have an individual type of factory. Um, the UML pattern looks like this, and here you can already see kind of the, the idea behind that. So the, um, the boxes, of course, represent classes in UML, and this is not strictly UML, this is kind of an annotation. These five sorts of classes together form the abstract factory pattern. Um, and for example, here you can already see how this is uh, supposed to work. You have an abstract class, which is just a GUI factory. And derived from that, for example, you have a Windows factory and a Mac OS factory. And each of these creates a, a button object and uh, the, those share an interface for a generic button and both of them together are used by the application. And now it's easily possible to swap out, for example, the Windows factory with the Windows user interface for the OS X factory that creates the OS X interface. And uh, basically if from the point of view of the application, it doesn't really matter which kind of user interface you're actually using. It always only calls the uh, GUI factory and gets back uh, a button object in which individual instance that is the, the application actually doesn't have to care. Um, this can actually simplify your code a lot. So here's an example. Um, if you if you would write something like this without using abstract factory, then you would need to have a, a choice up front in every so in every method that uses, for example. GUI elements you would have to check are we on Windows or are we on Mac OS and in that case we would need to create a, a button and a menu for Windows Oops, I'm sorry <laughs> and uh, in the other case we would need to create a button and a menu for uh, OS X Mac OS and if we have another operating system let's say Android or whatever then you would need to create an Android uh, button and menu and so on. And then when we're done, we, we paint the widgets finally. Um, so of course, if you have multiple um, places in your code where uh, user interface elements are used, then you would have to put something like this, if Windows, else if, OS X, else if, so and so. You would have to put something like this into every method and if you change something, you would have to update it in every place. On the other hand, if you have a factory, then you can just, at the very beginning of your program, instantiate one factory. Uh, so if you're on Windows, then you create a Windows factory. If you're on OS X, you create an OS X factory. And then afterwards, if you need a user interface element, you just call for example, create button and create menu on the factory, and you will get back a Windows button if you're an, if it's a Windows factory, an OS X button if it's a Mac factory, and so on. And so the code inside those um, those methods that actually create the UI elements would get a lot simpler because you don't really have to to care about anymore about um, what underlying factory actually uh, is creating the objects and what individual types you're getting back as long as it's a, as it's a 
button in the menu, or in this case a widget, then it's actually perfectly fine. And so the, tr the, the selection between which type or which family of UI element you want to use, that choice is basically reduced to one single um, switch where depending on that uh, those flags, if it's on Windows or OS X or so on, you create an individual type of factory. All right, so next up, uh, maybe you already saw it, is the factory method. This is now uh, a kind of a building block for an abstract factory, for example. So uh, the abstract factory needs a way to um, actually create the new objects without having to, to do all sorts of internal switches again. And so the uh, the call to new is now replaced with a method call. And generally, this is a so-called factory method. Um, this is also static, and it's part of the base class. And usually, this is called create. I'll show you an example. Um, so here, we have the super class. And um, the create method, depending on what kind of parameter you pass, will return an, an object of each individual subclass. Um, and then for each subclass, you can just extend and override uh, the, the individual methods as you see fit. Um, the important part is that you can now, just based on this, this choice parameter, get back uh, 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 individual types of, of subclasses, objects of subclasses, without having to put this sort of code, this sort of switch statement, uh, basically uh, into multiple places in your code. Um, there's also an alternative way to achieve the same thing, basically, which is to, uh, again, create new objects based on a, on a pool of objects. Here now, um, it's no longer a create method, but it's a clone method. And so the idea is that we actually do create uh, individual objects of each subclass up front at the start of the program. For example, when the factory is initialized, and uh, from this pool of prototype objects, we don't create copies uh, or we, we don't just do pass by, pass by reference, but we rather um, call the clone method and we'll get back a new duplicate of one of the objects from, from this uh, prototype pool. Um, once again, I'd like to show you a code example for that. So now we have, let's say we have an interface and this already has this clone method. And then we actually have a separate factory class, which here has again, a static array of prototypes. And that contains each of the uh, one object for each of the subclasses. And um, then when I actually want to create an object from the factory, again, based on that parameter. Then I select the appropriate um, object from the, from the prototypes array and call clone on that. And the clone method itself, for, for example, for this subclass, for Mo, it will just uh, return a new Mo object. So um, because the type is fixed by which subclass I'm creating here in the prototype array, then when I call clone here, it will also uh, delegate to the correct um, to the correct subclass, and that will return a new instance, a new object of the same class, not the same object, but the, a new object of the same class. And this is also a possible way to to solve this um, this mapping from uh, from a parameter that you give in, uh, hand over to the factory to actually returning the um, appropriate uh, object of that subclass. So um, this will actually also occur in the exercise. So uh, the fundamental idea is that you uh, want to create a factory which takes a name for, a, for an object class and returns back an object. Um, and usually it's a good idea here to use something like a hash map um, inside the factory class that's kind of a registry for the object. So you can either use the prototype approach where you have a copy of an object and give it a clone method, or you um, use method references. This is something Java allows. Uh, 
pointers basically to the to the new operator. Um, what's also important is that you should actually use singleton to make sure that you only have one factory ever, because otherwise uh, they might actually conflict with each other. And last but not least, if you find a way to use generics in Java to, to have a simpler, more cleaner code, then please do so. Um, just as a really quick uh, recapitulation of what generics actually are, um, you can have, for example, a template class with two different types. And this class just represents here now a pair of uh, two things, two objects. And uh, so you can, for example, put string, string, or string int, or whatever in there, and uh, just create this object that contains two variables which have type one and type two as uh, as actual type. And so the uh, the instantiation would then look like this, like so. For example, a pair of two strings, which you call let's call it translation, is then uh, created as a new pair object and which is actually given two string parameters. But you can use exactly the same class also for two int parameters or for string and int or for whatever you want. Um, and template methods are very similar. Here you just have one type parameter and this gives us a, a pair object with the same type twice and we'll just call the constructor of the original pair uh, class with the same parameter twice. And so here you get a, uh, a pair object that has two integer types and both of them will contain um, the value 42. All right. So in the next part, uh, for for more patterns, we'll also talk about the behavioral and structural patterns. And on top of that, about the user interface patterns and anti-patterns, which are things that <laughs> are often used as solutions, but which are actually uh, creating more problems than they solve. For this reason, they're called anti-patterns. And yeah, so these are th the th is the stuff we're going to talk about in the in the second part of this patterns lecture. So yeah, as usual, please don't forget to, to uh, use the Moodle discussion board if you have any questions, if anything was unclear. Um, and yeah, see you next time.